time. Amen. So thank you, Lord, for praying our hearing our prayer and answering our prayer for healing, Lord. Now we just continue to pray for salvation. Whoops. All right. Uh, if you would, please, we're not going to go there right away. But uh, if you brought a Bible with you, go to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. And we'll start at verse 21. We're not going to start there right away. But that's going to be the bulk of the scripture that we'll go through. Uh, these last few weeks, uh, if you haven't caught the thing, it's that God wants to give us an abundant life here on this earth. Amen. Let it be done here on earth as it is in heaven. I don't know about you, God, but when we make it to heaven, there's going to be no more sorrow or tears. You know the songs that we sing in the scriptures? No more sickness, no more death. Only joy and peace in the presence of God, the way things are supposed to be. Hallelujah. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that they might have life, and they, they might have it abundantly. more abundantly. Yeah. God is good. All the time. He is our Heavenly Father. He loves us. Amen. All the time. He wants us to experience the abundant life that comes through relationship with Him. Now, it doesn't mean everything's going to be peaches and cream. I've learned that one the hard way. When I first got saved, I knew I was going to heaven. I knew God loved me. That's all I knew. That's all I cared about. And I just thought I was going to coast through life. Happy, happy, joy, joy. Everything was going to be great. Uh, yeah. And then I very quickly discovered I was foolish. I was naive. I was ignorant. He's telling us that we have an enemy, and he's out to get us. But he is on our side. If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen? Amen? He wants to give us an abundant life in Christ. And the Bible says that the kingdom of God is love and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what God wants us to have. Even through all the trials and tribulations and persecutions, we can be of good cheer. We can have courage because Jesus has overcome this world. And I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ, the Bible says. Amen? Amen. If he's overcome this world, then through the Spirit of God and the blood of Jesus, I can overcome this world. I can have victory through faith in Jesus. So we have a promise from God that the abundant life is attainable. It is there within our grasp if we have faith to believe and if we have the faith to do what God's called us to do. We talked about many scriptures about we're in a spiritual battle. And the most of that battle takes place in our minds. We talked about all the negative worries and doubt and fear and all the lies of the enemy that try to tear us down. They try to uh, steal our peace and our joy. To try to maybe can't keep us out of heaven, but to distort our view of who God really is. So we have to be on guard. We've got to guard our hearts. We have to guard our minds. We have to be intentional. We have to put on the armor of God, and we have to be willing to fight so that we can enter into the promised land of abundant life that God's promised us. But I want to read a scripture to you, Luke chapter 4, 18 and 19, when Jesus first began his ministry, he stood up in church, and he read from the book of Isaiah, and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's an amazing scripture. That's why Jesus came. He came for the brokenhearted. He came to preach deliverance to those that were in captivity. He came to open blind eyes. He came to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the year of Jubilee. If you go back to the Old Testament, uh, God set up every seven years was the year of Jubilee. Amen. And what, what would happen is people would get in trouble. They would get into bad situations. They would get into debt, debt that they couldn't pay. And basically they would become indentured servants for six years. They would work for somebody to pay their debts off. <clears throat> their property became somebody else's. And they literally worked for six years for somebody else. But on the seventh year, whether your debt was paid or not, 
It was the year of Jubilee. That was the year where you had to forgive everybody's debts. You had to return their land to them. You had to restore them to where they were before they got into that bad situation. And this acceptable year of the Lord is Jesus is preaching on Jubilee. He's here to preach Jubilee to his people. That you can be set free. That you can be restored. Amen. That you can be established again. That everything that you lost, you can have back and more. So Jesus came with good news. That's what gospel means, good news. We always think that God's angry. And, you know, God's against us. And, and God's, you know, I used to think back in the day that God was this up there in heaven, this old man sitting on a throne with white hair and a long beard and a big stick in his hand. And every time I messed up and I did something wrong, he was punishing me. That was my distorted view of who God was. But Jesus came to open my blind eyes to see who he really was. Amen? Mm -hmm. So, he has come to set the captives free. Oh, it's man. about freedom. It's about the abundant life in Christ. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Then he said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Yeah. I'm here to preach good news to us, church. We've got abundant life promised to us by Jesus Christ. And if God promises us, then we can have it. Amen? But we've got to fight for it. We've got to fight that spiritual battle. We've got to capture those negative, untruthful thoughts that try to weigh us down and tear us down. We've got to recognize them, capture them, and bring them into obedience to Christ. And that's through the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But he came to set us free. One more scripture before we get into the meat of our sermon today. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. There is freedom. I can be free. Free from all these things that he came to deliver us from. In Acts chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. So I'm hoping and praying this morning that these scriptures will encourage us, that they will strengthen our faith. And you know what? I'm not supposed to be walking around with my head hanging. You know, my, my dad used to tell me, you know, you better pick up your lip or you're going to trip on it. I used to walk around with my head down, always feeling bad about myself, always thinking I was a failure, always thinking I wasn't good enough. You know? But that's a lie. Amen. I didn't know it back then because I didn't have a relationship with Jesus, but, you know, I lived most of my life thinking that I was a failure, that I wasn't good enough, that, that, that you know, but it's not the truth. I used to think and wonder, does anybody actually really love me? But the truth of the matter is, there was one that loved me. His name was Jesus. And even though I messed up and made a lot of terrible mistakes, he come to preach jubilee to me. Amen. That I could be healed, I could be saved, I could be delivered, I could be restored. That's right. And not only that, I could be blessed and prospered and shown favor by God. And he could lift me up. Amen? Amen. But one of the things, and I think this is going to be the last installment of the series. I, I didn't plan on preaching another sermon in the series of The Abundant Life, but... Uh, there's one more thing that God impressed upon me uh, as I was trying to discern what God wanted me to minister on this week. There's one more thing that can hold us back from experiencing the abundant life that God wants us to have. We talked about fear and anxiety. We talked about worry. Uh, we talked about the negative thoughts and lies that, that the enemy uses to deceive us and distort our view of uh, our God and our relationship with him. But there's one more that I want to talk about that can be a, a tough one. And it's unforgiveness. Uh, many of us uh, consciously or unconsciously choose to live in a prison of unforgiveness. Amen. And that's what it is really. It's a prison. You know, Paul is telling us in 2 Corinthians that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's right. 
The stronghold is something, it's basically brick, brick, stone, block walls that are built to keep people in or to keep people out. So unforgiveness can be a prison. Unforgiveness steals our joy, our peace. It steals our love because we spend all of our time focusing on the offenses that were done to us. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I don't excuse people's actions. When people do wrong, they do wrong. It's okay to be hurt, but it's not okay to live in unforgiveness. That is not God's will for us. He came to set us free. Amen. Amen. So, when we're constantly focusing and, and rehashing and rehearsing the offenses that have happened to us in our pasts, this traps us in a vicious cycle of living in the past and harboring bitterness, resentment, and hate in our hearts. Now, a lot of us don't think in that way. Unforgiveness is really, it's, it's a form of anger and hatred right. against someone for something that they've done to hurt us. Not only does unforgiveness ruin our lives in the here and now, which is exactly the opposite of what God wants for us, but it could cost us in the life that comes next. You know, I know we live this life and we're focused on our jobs and our families and paying bills and most of our time and attention and focus is on the things of this world. But the truth of the matter is, I think I mentioned this scripture before, that we're not supposed to be focusing on temporary things, the things of this life, but we're supposed to be focusing our attentions on things that are eternal because those are the things that really matter. Amen? Amen. So let's go ahead and go to Matthew chapter 18. We'll start in verse 21. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive them? Till seven times? And I'm sure Peter thought he was being pretty generous, I would imagine. <laughs> He's thinking not once, not twice, not three times, not four, five, six times, seven times. Surely that's enough forgiveness, right? But Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee, or I say not unto thee, until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now let me ask you a question. I'm no math whiz, but I know that seventy times seven equals four hundred and ninety. Do you think Jesus is literally telling Peter? Okay, they got up to 489 times to mess up, and you got to forgive them, but on number 490, that's it. You can write them off. It's kind of a trick question in a way, but it's not. We all know that that's not what Jesus is really saying here. Peter's saying seven times, that should be enough, right, God? And the Lord says to him, now, nah, seven times 70. You got to keep on forgiving. You got to keep on forgiving. That's how we're supposed to live, is in forgiveness. 23 says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents, which you could, some translations say, a million dollars, a huge astronomical amount of money. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. <clears throat> then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him his debt. Now remember, we're talking about a million bucks. This is not an ordinary small thing. This is a tremendously huge debt that was forgiven. Amen. Verse 28 says, The same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, a very small amount of money. 
And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but he, but he went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. <coughs> then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee, let's see, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desired me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one of his, every one his brother of the, their trespasses. That's harsh. Yeah. There's good news in there, and there's bad news in there. The good news is that our king is a compassionate king. That we owe a debt to him that we could never repay. But if we come to him and we're humble and we say, Lord, basically, please forgive me. He will have compassion on us. He will forgive us of our debts. He will let us go free. That's good news. But the moral of the story here is that God will not tolerate unforgiveness. Amen. And that, that's, that's a harsh reality that we, we have to deal with as Christians because I'll be honest with you, one of the hardest battles I've had to fight in my walk with God was with unforgiveness against people that have hurt me, people that have wronged me. Some of the, <laughs> some of the most uh, terrible spiritual battles I've ever had to fight was with forgiving people that have done me wrong. It's a hard thing to do. But it's God's will for me and it's God's will for you. He wants us to be free. Free from bitterness and free from anger and free from resentment. Free from living in the prison of past offenses. God wants us to be free so that we can experience joy and love and peace through the Spirit. Amen? That's what the kingdom of God is. That's what he wants for us. I'm going to read a few more scriptures. I just want, you, want us to meditate on that parable there. God is merciful and forgiving to those that come to him. Is it all ready? Okay. But he can be very harsh and strict with those who refuse to forgive. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15 says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. So Jesus is teaching us, his children, to pray. He says, this is how I want you to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day thy daily bread. And now to catch this. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now that's a good prayer to pray. A lot, of, a lot of stuff in there that he teaches us how to pray, what we should pray for. But one is, we need to remember, God has forgiven me very much. Absolutely. God has forgiven me a tremendous debt that I could never pay. And freely I've been given. Now freely I need to give. Amen. We need to share with others what God has given to us. And the most important thing of all is forgiveness of sin. So he teaches us to pray for forgiveness, but he also teaches us to pray that we forgive others that have wronged us. Mark chapter 11, verse 25 and 26 says, And when you stand praying, forgive, if you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Now that seems harsh, but God's making it very clear to us 
He has designed us to live in a particular way in his kingdom. And one of those requirements is we have received forgiveness. We are to extend forgiveness, whether they deserve it or not. And I'll be honest with you, most of the people that we have to forgive, they don't deserve it. They've done wrong. But the Bible teaches us that vengeance is the Lord's. Amen? We're to put them in God's hands. You, God, you know them. You know what they did. I choose by faith to forgive them, but Lord, you do whatever you need to do. God, they're yours. They belong to you. That, that can be freedom right there. You're releasing yourself from unforgiveness and bitterness and anger and resentment so that you can open up your heart to God to receive the love, peace, and joy that he wants us to have. Romans chapter 12, verse 14 says, Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Now this is after, remember, with the scriptures we read a couple of weeks ago, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Be not conformed to this world, but be changed and transformed by the renewing of our minds. He's telling us, hey, even though we live in this world, this world is not our home. We have a king, and we live in his kingdom. And he has his laws and his ways that we're supposed to abide by. And one of them is that we're supposed to be a blessing to those that persecute us. Bless and curse not. Talk about spiritual warfare. That's spiritual warfare right there. The Bible says that we're not supposed to walk in the flesh, but walk in the spirit, because our flesh wars against the spirit of God. That the carnal mind is an enmity with God. My ways are not his ways. His thoughts are much higher. His ways are much higher than mine. So I need to submit to the spirit of God, and I need to learn to forgive those who have wronged me. Why? Ephesians chapter 1, verses 6 through 7 says... To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. We were created in the image of God. We were created to be like God. And if God is love, and if God is merciful and compassionate, if God is forgiving, and guess what? God's calling me to do the same thing. Right. To follow in his footsteps and extend grace. Maybe where it's not even deserved. As we get ready to close out, I want to share a brief testimony of what spiritual warfare looks like when you're dealing with forgiveness, at least from my experience. Many years ago when I first got saved, I was learning the word of God. I was learning God's will for my life. I was learning how to uh, kill out the old man and to walk in the spirit. And uh, make a long story short, there's, I worked at a plastic injection molding company. And I worked hard. I took pride in my work because I, you know, I, I know that I'm supposed to do everything as under the Lord. Right? So I go into work every night, work 12 hour shifts. I, I work my tail off. And uh, I'm trying to serve God and honor God. And, uh, make a long story short, for some reason, there was a guy, um, his name was Rick, who just took a disliking to me for some reason. I was good to him, never done him wrong. Um, he just decided he didn't like me one bit. And uh, he decided, I found out later, that he conspired with some other people uh, to get me fired. And make a long story short, uh, he got me wrote up. They called me into the office one morning at the end of my shift. And he said, you know, sit down, we're going to have a talk. Uh, basically, I was accused of doing something that I didn't do. And uh, I got wrote up. And I was absolutely flabbergasted. Uh, it just blindsided me like a semi-truck. And uh, I was just, I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to say. I, you know, I just... I remember going home. I don't know if you remember this, but my wife was there. And, uh, I came home and I started bawling like a baby. I mean, just blubbering. I don't wear my emotions on my sleeve. I'm a tough guy and all that stuff. But I mean, it, that just wounded me Amen. so badly. I, I just, I thought he was my friend. And uh, I just bawled my eyes out and told my wife what had happened. And she's kind of looking at me, probably.
probably because he's like, what is wrong with you? You're not like, you know? <laughs> I mean, it just, it just grieved my heart. And uh, she left to go to work or something, I don't remember, but I remember sitting there that morning, I couldn't sleep, and uh, I got so angry. Uh, I was, actually, I was like, you could say I was enraged. And uh, I started thinking in my mind, when I go to work tonight, come shift change in the morning, I'm gonna grab a hold of him, drag him out in the parking lot, beat and him. I'm gonna beat him within an inch of his life. <laughs> I was so, so angry. And as I was pouring out my heart to God and complaining to God about how I'd been wronged, how I was being persecuted, how I was innocent, how I didn't deserve this, you know what the Holy Spirit said to me? I didn't hear him with my ears, but I heard the Holy Spirit speak to my heart. He told me two words. Forgive him. Lord, are you crazy? You know what he did. You know he lied. You know that he tried to give me fire. God, I didn't do anything wrong. Why should I forgive him? He deserves to be punished. You know? And I was so angry. And God spoke to my heart and said, forgive him. But God, man, I kept arguing with God. Lord, you know what he did. And he kept telling me, forgive him. And finally, I broke down and said, all right, Lord. I forgive him. And uh, about two seconds later, I thought about what had happened. I got angry again. I wanted to beat him up again. And I felt convicted in my heart. And I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I know. I know. I need to forgive him. Lord, I forgive him. And about a minute or two later, I got angry again because I rehearsed it in my mind again. And I wanted to beat him up again. And the Holy Spirit convicted me again and said, forgive him. All right, Lord, I'm sorry. I forgive him. And that battle went on for a while. It was a struggle. It was a fight. Because everything in me wanted to pay him back for what he had done. Right. To make a long story short, thank God for his Holy Spirit, I was able to, by faith, even though my heart still hurt, I was still wounded, I was able to forgive him. And the next morning, uh, when my shift was over, we would have a... a ship change meeting and we went through the meeting and uh, when the meeting was over I typically hit the door and go home go to bed but um, Rick went to the office and I felt compelled to go talk to Rick so I went in the office and I shut the door behind me and Rick looked up and his eyes got big because he's thinking uh oh nothing good is about to happen here right and I looked at him and I said, Rick, what have I done to offend you? And he just kind of looked at me. Nothing. I said, Rick, I want you to know that what you did was wrong, but I forgive you. And I turned around and I walked and I went home. And uh, for several years after that, Rick actually was good to me. We weren't best friends, okay? We were workmates, you know, we were friendly, we were good acquaintances and everything, but Rick never bothered me again after that. Now, what would have happened if I'd given in to my simple desires and done to Rick what I thought he deserved? You think I would have won a friend? No. Nope. I would have gotten fired, which was bad. I would have gone to jail, which would have been bad. I had a wife and children. I would have hurt somebody, which is bad. I would have tarnished uh, my reputation as a follower of Jesus Christ, which would have been probably the worst of all. But because through the grace of God and through the Holy Spirit, I was able to submit to God and extend the same forgiveness God gave to me, God was able to repair that divide, and God was able to work. And I think the moral of the story is, is number one, God wants me to be free. God wants me to be free. And the only way that I can be free is to fight for the abundant life. Fight unforgiveness, fight worry, fight doubt, fight fear, fight the lies of the enemy that try to distort our view of God and distort our view of ourselves. 
We've got to fight the fight of faith and trust in God's word, trust in his promises. Very, very close thing.